Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Iron Coffins Part 20. U-230 broke its radio silence and reported, Sunk 3, 16,000 tons. Fourth one torpedoed, no sinking observed, low fuel supply. I had just been relieved from my watch and was pouring a few liters of seawater from my diving suit into the bilge when the commander stuck his head through the watertight door into the control room. His rugged face was framed by a three-week-old red beard. His teeth shone bright white. Exo, one of the other boats, spotted the convoy. Let's go hunting. Both engines ahead full. The news spread through the boat like wildfire. I hung my wet clothes in the rear torpedo room to dry, ran naked through the bouncing boat to my bunk, put on fresh clothes and joined a small conference around the commander's desk. We leaned over the moldy sea chart on which Praga had already marked the reported location of the convoy. Despite the constant pitching and rolling, we managed to determine the best attack course. The hunt began. While the pounding diesel engines drove the boat over the gigantic wave mountains, the torpedo mixers operated their fish, the stokers oiled their machines, the men tended to their electric motors and batteries, the radio operators deciphered an uninterrupted chain of shorthand signals and the watch on the bridge stood in the water up to their armpits. Everyone worked like seasoned warriors. The wind came from behind and blew the men on the bridge against the tower casing like wet leaves. Massive waves lifted the boat skyward and hurled it forward like an arrow. Only when evening descended did the sea lose some of its ferocity. But as soon as day broke, the storm gained new, unrestrained force and piled the waves to greater heights. At the end of the first day of our hunt, as twilight blurred the horizon, we encountered the long-range security of the convoy. U-230 prepared for its second attack. A typical destroyer silhouette to starboard. Slight course change to port, and U-230, shaken by heartbreakers, persevered in the assumed direction of the convoy. After 15 wind-whipped, tension-filled minutes, we made contact with the enemy again. Two shadows, widely spaced, shot towards us from the curtain of mist and darkness. We advanced further, closed in, always further ahead, penetrated both signatures and went ahead to where we suspected the convoy. Suddenly, visibility was zero. Snowflakes splattered on our faces. The threat of collision with one of the enemy vehicles loomed ominously before our tortured eyes. Nevertheless, Siegmann continued to push his boat further and deeper into the raging night. 2.17 am. A destroyer suddenly tore through the curtain, rushing past us on the opposite course only 200 meters starboard ahead and then vanished into a hailstorm. Another advance to starboard. The bulky targets had to be hiding somewhere. With roaring diesels, we raced into nothingness. 20 minutes passed, but no contact with the enemy was established. We changed our course to port. Soaked to the skin and freezing like a pack of wolves in a Siberian snowstorm, we clung to the cleats of the bridge to avoid being washed away by the sea and stared intently into the impenetrable darkness. Hour after hour passed, but no convoy still. This night, we had seven or eight encounters with destroyers, but found no trace of the group of steamers. March 10th. 6.40 am. The commander released the exhausted crew from battle stations and descended into the darkened boat, but not without instructions. XO, I'll catch a nap. Report any change in the situation immediately. I stayed on the bridge to complete my watch. Green dirty waves with long white foam streaks turned the sea into dark marble. A thundering wind drove heavy clouds low over the water, allowing the morning twilight to shine through here and there. Banks of mist rose and fell hazily in the half-light. Then snow and hail came drumming down. Sea state was 4 to 5 and visibility was only 200 to 300 meters. 7.10 am. I sniffed. There was a distinct smell of burnt diesel oil in the air. 7.13 am. The stench grew sharper quickly. Suddenly we burst through a wall of clouds, the sky cleared and before us lay about six ships swaying in a bright spot. Captain to the bridge, crew to battle stations. An earth-shattering blast. The nearest vessel, 500 meters to port, a 10,000-ton freighter, exploded and shattered into pieces. The shockwave hit us with tremendous force. Our lungs felt like they might burst. Siegmund's head appeared in the hatch but quickly disappeared as the gigantic pyrotechnic spectacle hurled huge fragments through the air and rained tons of debris down upon us. The crew took cover behind the bridge casing. 
Seconds later, when I dared to peek over the bridge's edge, I saw five ships lumbering through the waves. But there, less than 1000 meters to starboard, two destroyers rushed out from behind a freighter, heading straight for us. A third one approached from astern. There was only one solution. Clear the bridge, full speed ahead on both engines, alarm! We had but one course of action. A swift descent to a deep, safe death. We had to endure the punishment meant for the boat that had torpedoed the steamer. U-230 trembled and fought desperately to submerge. But it was as if the surface tension held it in place, like it was swimming in a sea of thick glue. All available men stumbled and staggered into the bow compartment and the shifted weight finally caused the boat to tilt, while the deafening, grinding cadence of the destroyer screws grew closer. U-230 burrowed deep into the depths with incredible sluggishness. A series of eight depth charges pounded our boat with harsh blows, sending it steeply toward the bottom of the Atlantic. Friedrich managed to arrest the boat at 200 meters, 650 feet. He guided it through the pendulum motion and steered hastily. U-230 swung almost silently into an evasive turn. We heard the convoy veering east and the elastic pulses hitting our pressure hull. Minutes after the first attack, 16 depth charges detonated over our tower. An infernal concert. Would this be the end? The steel groaned, wooden locks splintered, ear splitting crashes, splintering, hissing, roaring, rolling, tearing. Sharp course changes to avoid the next salvo. But the adversary above us was no novice. A new carpet of 24 canisters exploded over our stern. We were hurled onto the floor, thrown against the ceiling. Water level glasses shattered, pipelines hissed, water sprayed, bearded faces turned towards the ceiling. Bloodshot eyes anxiously searched for a deadly breach in a thin steel skin. The signals men at the rear bulkhead whispered, Both stuffing boxes are taking on water. The chief engineer tried in vain to level the boat on an even keel. Numerous water breaches had filled the aft bilges. The boat hung with heavy stern, weighing as if by a threat. U-230 descended further, always descending with increasing heaviness. Death charges exploded every 20 minutes, 9 hours passed and the destroyers were still dropping their canisters. The cold seeped through the steel pressure hull, making us shiver, tremble and shake. Moisture condensed on the bare bulkhead, on pipelines and air ducts, soaking us to the skin. U-230 drifted ever deeper into the unfathomable depth. The chief engineer fought desperately to halt the sinking. The boat had descended to 245 meters, about 800 feet, and it seemed as if he might plummet into eternity. If the pursuit didn't cease soon and we couldn't lift the boat to a shallower depth, our final destination would be the bottom of the North Atlantic, around 5000 meters beneath our keel. But as the day came to an end, the unbelievable happened. The three destroyers veered off, racing eastward toward the convoy. We remained submerged at a somewhat more comfortable depth for another two hours before surfacing. I vowed to find the commander of the boat whose torpedoes had brought the destroyers and death charges upon us. Weeks later, I learned that Kapitän Leutnant Troyer and U-221 had torpedoed the ammunition ship. Unfortunately, fate didn't grant me the opportunity to tell him the dire straits he had put us in. U-221 was lost on a subsequent mission and there were no survivors. We ventilated the boat pumped the bilges, recharged our batteries, repaired the damage, informed command and then sped back into the night. In the early morning hours, Riedel decrypted a signal from high command. According to it, our group had sunk six ships totaling over 50,000 tons during the three day and night battle. The message also instructed us to assume a position in a new picket line and await orders concerning refueling. The task was to intercept and disrupt a larger formation coming from Halifax. Based on various reports we intercepted in the following hours, I concluded that something extraordinary was unfolding. At least 40 submarines had been deployed across an area of 80,000 square miles, traversing the most well-known convoy routes in the North Atlantic. U-230 took its place in the picket line shortly thereafter, patrolling for three days in exceptionally rough seas, which depleted its fuel to a dangerously low level. On March 16th, a boat from our group made contact with convoy SC-122 and reported its position. Without delay, 40 U-boats received the order, All boats of Wolfpack Raubgraf operate at maximum speed on convoy, square BD-14, over 60 ships, course northeast, speed 9 knots. We calculated that we could reach the formation in 12 to 14 hours and that we just had enough fuel to stay with the convoy for one night and deliver our last torpedoes. 
With renewed energy, we pursued it. Despite the extraordinary strain of a seven-week battle against hurricanes, snowstorms, towering sea and a resolute adversary, the crew's morale and spirits were at their peak. We had sunk ships and torpedoed another one whose sinking was imminent. It was a fitting reward for our presumed weeks-long struggles against the elements and a tenacious opponent, a feat we could all be proud of. Somewhere in the southeast, where night had already descended on the sea, the convoy rocked, its officers and crew constantly facing the danger of being attacked, decimated and sunk instantly. This danger grew with every mile and was most significant in the middle of the Atlantic. And this point would be reached the following night. Two hours after the sun had sunk into the water, the moon rose behind the rapidly passing clouds. Its yellow, pale light was of no help to us. On the contrary, it hindered us from shooting at close range. But as the night progressed, the intense storm subsided. With roaring engines, we stormed toward the calculated location of the massive convoy. A few hours later, one boat reported contact with the convoy. However, the newly reported location was much further east than previously assumed. We commenced a swift change of course, followed by a pursuit. But with each mile we traveled in a northeasterly direction, our chance of returning to port decreased. Yet, despite the high fuel consumption and the prospect of empty tanks, Siegmann continued the pursuit of the convoy. At times, snow flurries obscured our view. Then again, the silvery light of the increasing moon swept over the moving glittering sea like a spotlight. By midnight, eight boats reported contact with the enemy. New situation and location reports followed one after the other like lightning in a thunderstorm. In the early morning hours of March 17th, six more boats reported that they had made contact with the enemy. A convoy battle of unforeseen magnitude seemed to be unfolding. Excited by the shorthand signals and numerous cups of strong coffee, we flew with our boat toward the convoy. A glare behind the eastern horizon. A second one followed. There, just miles ahead, was the enemy. We focused our eyes on the horizon, standing out against the night sky, illuminated by the moon. Destroyer, starboard, 120 degrees, announced Rocher, our seasoned navigator. Siegmann immediately forced his boat into a northerly course. The shadow followed us relentlessly. Then Siegmann sent the boat into a wild zigzag maneuver, but the pursuer stuck to the white wake of our keel. Breaker after breaker shattered against the tower, drenching us and the boat in a white shower of spray that made, us light, that made us light up like a torch. Minute after minute passed in a relentless pursuit. Clearly visible in the moonlight, the destroyer's superstructure stood out against the night sky. Siegmann stubbornly held onto the surface. He knew we had a chance to escape here, while a crash dive would result in a long death charge chase. He knew that a wrong decision could mean our death, so we raced away in a northerly direction with our powerful binoculars pressed to our eye sockets. 20 or 25 minutes that seemed like an eternity and then a snow squall obscured our view. With a sharp change of course, we disappeared into the emerging blizzard. 15 minutes later, we veered eastward, back towards the convoy. Suddenly, flares to port. A dreadful explosion followed. Our boats clung to the convoy and then there was only the howling and roaring of the storm and the rush of the sea in the air. Shortly afterward, we received orders from High Command to refuel from U-463, a U-boat tanker, in Grid Square BE-12 on March 22nd and then to immediately commence the return journey. But during this night, luck was not with us. At 4.40 am, Friedrich reported to the captain that he could no longer justify another approach and that a second pursuit by destroyers could be deadly. In other words, our fuel tanks were nearly empty. Siegmann, his lips chapped, his eyes red and his beard bleached white by salt water, reluctantly gave the order to abandon the chase. U-230 withdrew from the battlefield. Throughout the entire night we saw flickering flashes, heard the sharp barking of torpedo detonations and the breaking of bulkheads and ship hulls. As the morning sun hesitantly rose, dispelling the fog and sending red and golden clouds into the light blue sky, the Allies had lost 14 ships with over 90,000 tons. Six more vessels were damaged and slowly drifted eastward through the whipping sea. U-230, its fuel almost exhausted, provisions spoiled or consumed, began the long march to the Biscay coast. As we sailed southeast through new snowstorms, the battle against convoy SC-122 continued with the other boats. As March 17th drew to a close, 
eight more merchant ships had sunk to their watery graves. And as the night of March 18th descended upon hunters and hunted, the thunder of water bomb explosions and torpedo detonations echoed over the Atlantic and the Allied convoy's fight for survival reached a new climax. Throughout the following day, our boats pursued the enemy, biting and shooting their way through the dwindling fleet. Then the boats suddenly discovered a second convoy, HX-229, in the wake of the first. And a new battle began. Soon. The two battered convoys merged, 91 merchant ships, over 30 destroyers and corvettes battling 38 submarines. The battle raged on for two more nights and three days. The endless expanse of the Atlantic echoed with the sharp sound of torpedo hits and the horrifying crash of breaking ships. Only when the U-boats had expended their fuel and fired all their torpedoes, when new snowstorms covered the severely battered Allied formations with snow and hail, and when their wounded remnants finally reached the protection of British long-range bombers, only then did the infernal battle come to an end. The floor of the Atlantic was littered with the wrecks of Allied ships. A laconic report from the U-boat command described the extent of our victory. It read, A total of 32 ships with 186,000 tons and one destroyer sunk, plus hits on nine more ships. This is the most significant success in a convoy battle so far, made even more satisfying as almost 50% of the U-boats were actively involved. While one of the greatest naval battles in history caused the lives of 32 British, American, Dutch, Norwegian, Greek and Panamanian ships, we had lost only one U-boat. U-384 had fallen victim to the bombs of an aircraft from the British Coastal Command on the last day of this colossal engagement. On March 22nd, a grey and hazy day, we met the supply ship in the assigned quadrant. The wind blew from the southwest with Force 4, sea state was Force 3. We fished the rubber ball with the loose end of the hose which the tanker pulled in its wake. We connected the end to an external valve and then began to suck the precious black oil on board. After a two-hour challenging transfer during which the dancing boats kept a careful distance, we disconnected the hose from the tanker, bid the men of U-463 a safe journey and set course for the European mainland. Two days later, U-230 reached the western reaches of the Bay of Biscay. Our rusty, sea-battered boat made only 14 knots. Siegmann announced of the loudspeaker that we were heading to Brest. For me, that meant returning to the port where I had left Yvonne. I was quite content with my favorable prospects. The world was wonderful. And this is a good place to go to the after action report, I think. Uh, lots to talk about here, starting with the huge convoy engagement that Herbert talks about. Uh, this actually was the biggest convoy battle in the North Atlantic. Both convoys, um, HX229er and um, SC122, suffered greatly during the three-day engagement when they were constantly harassed by not one but three wolf packs totaling 39 boats. The actual losses were 22 merchant vessels and one submarine, so a bit less than what High Command would report via radio. Uh, more than 300 merchant sailors died as a result and I have put the names of the ships on screen to pay them our respects. It took massive balls to undertake these tours on merchant ships, especially at this point in the war where most of them weren't even armed. Uh, it's interesting to know that during this time Germany actually had introduced a new type of Enigma um, cipher machine that was as yet unbroken, but on the other hand British communications were being deciphered by the Germans totally, so the route of each convoy was known. In this battle only one U-boat was lost, U-384, when it was bombed by a B-17 flying fortress, believe it or not. All in all, this entire battle was placing serious doubts in the minds of the British Admiralty, but it should be the last one with this kind of success. Moving on, U-221, you remember the boat which engaged the convoy when our very own boat approached and drew the ire of two destroyers which then in turn engaged U-230, thinking them to be the attackers. U-221 was commanded by Kapitän Leutnant Hans Hartwig Troja, a bearer of the Knight's Cross. Now, Troja was nicknamed Count Dracula, which you wouldn't guess by his portrait, which I've put on screen. It was just because he was actually born in Transylvania, in Romania. You see, nicknames came easy back then, as they do today. U-221 uh, itself was sunk by a British Halifax bomber on September the 27th, 1943, with the loss of all hands. 
but only after they managed to critically damage said Halifax with their AA weapons. Uh, the Halifax had to ditch in the North Atlantic with most of the crew surviving the crash. Uh, the survivors boarded a single life raft and they held out for 11 days on their own in the North Atlantic, after which they were discovered by accident and survived. So, many things happening, but spoiler, the tide is turning for the German Navy, as you know, and we will see the first symptoms of this in the next episode. I will see you then. Cheers.